Pozdravljeni in dobrodošli. Greetings to all and welcome. Saluti e benvenuti a tutti. Saludos i bienvenidos a todos. Willkommen, Huayin, Huayin, at the second Congress of the International Center of Studies of Contemporary Nihilism with a topic and thinking about human existence and coexistence in the epoch, epoch of nihilism. Special thanks to the chairman of the Congress and the organizing committee, Professor Dr. Dejan Komel, the director of the Institute's Nova Revia, Tomasz Zalaznik, and the co-directors of CENIC, Professor Dr. Adriano Fabris and Professor Dr. Alfredo Rocha de la Torre. I would like to invite all the organizers to open this Congress with a few words. Professor. Dear conference participants, thank you that you are coming to our conference. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to Ljubljana, where the idea of founding of our institute was born 18 years ago. And Forum for the Humanities was founded nine years ago. So we have not so... Uh, long uh, past, but nevertheless, we try to do our best. Uh, during this time, it's 11, uh, 18 years, we organized many conferences and discussions in Ljubljana and abroad, and we will had many colleagues as guests of our institutes who gave this lect their lectures or published their contributions in journal Phenomena. Today conference has roots uh, even before COVID, where De Dan Kumail, head of the research activity of our institute, was preparing our research program for the next period. In the last year, through, in the last year, through written correspondence via email and via Zoom, our today conference was created. And therefore, I sincerely thank all three of professors, Alfredo Roja de la Torre, Adriano Fabris, and especially Dan Comil. So now I'm asking them to present their views on the conference. I wish all a good conference. Thank you. Liebe Kolleginnen und liebe Kollegen, es ist mir eine große Freude, Sie zu unserem zweiten internationalen Sendungskongress begrüßen zu dürfen. Ein besonderer Dank geht in meinen Namen an Professoren Tim Kommel und Professor Thomas für ihre großartige Unterstützung und ihr hervorragendes organisatorisches Engagement. Vielen Dank, dass Sie dazu beitragen haben, diesen zweiten Zenit-Kongress zu ermöglichen. Es ist nun fünf Jahre her, dass Professor Adriano Fauris und ich die Aufgabe in Angriff genommen haben, dieses internationale Zentrum für Nihilismus aufzubauen. Wir haben Mitglieder aus mehr als 15 Ländern und hoffen nicht nur, dass es noch mehr werden, sondern auch, dass wir weiterhin die philosophische Reflexion über die Erfahrung des Nihilismus anregen, gerade in einer Zeit, die so viele Herausforderungen für die Menschen bereits heilt. Ich heiße Sie also herzlich willkommen und hoffe, dass wir nicht nur gute Ideen mitnehmen könnten, die uns inspirieren, sondern vor allem eine Erfahrung des Dialogs unter Freunden. Danke. Vielen Dank. So I'd like, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to Ljubljana and uh, for your participation on this Congress. Especially uh, thank to Professor Alfredo Rocha de la Torre and Professor, and Professor Adriano Fabris 
that they have established this center for nihilistic studies some years ago, and uh, that we today have op opportunity to uh, organize the second congress of, of this uh, center. So my special thanks get to uh, my colleagues on the Institute, Nova Rivia, Director Tomas Zelaznik, uh, and uh, Mansa Rzetic, and, uh, and, and Andrei Božić as moderators, and then Giga Stopper to, uh, for technical support, and other, or other Eva Hood. And uh, so I will, I will ask Adriano to start because we have a lot of, of lectures and we have to start immediately. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for um, having uh, organized uh, this uh, occasion uh, to thinking uh, uh, together. Uh, thank you to Tomas, uh, to Dan, uh, to Alfredo, uh, to all that are here present. Uh, I think that is uh, an example of uh, to make philosophy uh, in common. Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, um, uh, speak about uh, the transformation <clears throat> In the idea of humanity in our age, our age is the age of a technological nihilism. <coughs> yes, because we live in the age of technological nihilism. But what do I mean to say with, with this expression? I mean that nowadays, at least in the West and in the prevalent mindset of the West, a way of thinking has been replaced twice with a different one, both arcing back to technological progress. Both replacement may be defined as nihilistic. Actually, they are the very embodiment of the nihilism of our age. The first one is the replacement of meaning with explanation. It is a process that feels ambiguous that we need to explore. The second one is the replacement of purposeful theoretical explanation with purposeless praxis. Purposeful theoretical explanation and purposeless praxis. It is an event that occurs most effectively and efficiently in the realm of technology. Let's have a brief look at these two points. There is a way of being in the world that has been developed first by myth, then by philosophy, and then the spread in the West with the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Regardless of the forms in which such ways of being in the world used to be developed in such three cases, myth, philosophy, religions, the same strategy was adopted. The human being was in the world, but at the same time, with his thoughts and his her actions, he or she was part of a broader context. Such context was a context of meaning. Such meanings could be told. They have been told in different ways in each one of the cases I mentioned, myth, philosophy, religions. A narrative enabled one to understand the thoughts and actions of a human being from a broader perspective, that is, by giving them a specific place. Such perspective 
provided a general framework and over a horizon that allowed the human being to find and articulate the meaning of what he did. These mainly happened by showing the relationships in which such behavior was involved. Such relationships made it possible to identify responsibilities for some processes and place them within the flow of a linear time, a time that is which had a past, a present, and a future. Now, this approach is not so widespread in the common mindset anymore. It is not, at least in the West, it is not at least for most people in the West. Actually, the meaningful perspective has been replaced with an explanatory perspective. Or rather, the explanation looks like the true meaning nowadays. Explaining mean, means finding the causes why something is what it is. It is not a responsibility in the broad sense of the word that is at stake here. Here, cause means efficient cause, something that is quantitatively measured in its efficiency and calculated in its actual effectiveness, depending on what it affects. It is a relationship that put causes and effects on a pair. There is no need to refer to an ulterior reality in what he, she is, and in what he, she does, the human being completely belongs to the same unique and consistent level as the natural world. All he or she thinks, lives and does can be explained with reference to such dimension. Every relationship that concerns us should therefore be considered we might say, horizontally, horizontally. That is, within one and the same horizon, on the same level. There is no need for an external point of reference, an ulterior look that might provide the narrative that concerns me. The narrative is replaced by knowledge. More to the point, it is replaced by a certain, a certain kind of knowledge. Knowing, knowing, in fact, means piecing a relationship, specific relationships together. Relationships between interlinked parties, relationships in which the parties involved are put on a par and become the object of a the theory that because of such standardization and oversimplification, can deal with these and other similar processes procedurally according to mathematical models. Thus, the reference to an ulterior perspective, to something we might say vertical, vanishes. Everything is brought back to the here and now. Time itself, instead of stretching out across the past, the present, and the future, shrinks into the instant. The meaning, the narrative that might concern what I am doing, my place within an ulterior dimension, all this disappears. It disappears because every ulterior dimension fades away. There is no global view from which I could look at what I do and what I am anymore. There is no external point of reference at all. If I create it for my convenience, I can destroy it too. So, the nihilism of meaning prevails. But a paradox happens too. 
actually. Nowadays, it is precisely such overall explanation, the belief that we can explain everything and nothing else is needed, that makes sense of our being in the world. It is the myth of science and its way forward. It is the meaning provided by the proclamation of meaninglessness. It is an ambiguous statement of nihilism. One, on one hand, it proclaims that nothing makes sense. On the other hand, the idea prevails that such a background can actually provide meaning, direction, certainties for our being in the world. <clears throat> the second instance of contemporary nihilism concerns not only the area of knowledge and direction, but concern, above all, the area of action. It is clear that between the two dimensions, knowledge and action, there is a tight connection, that connection that has bound theory and praxis, and knowledge and technique together for some time now. However, things have changed. We no longer have to do with the practical approach of technique, but with the action of technology. Between technique and technology, there is a key conceptual difference, regardless of the fact that historically the latter uh, technique uh, developed from the former through specific processes of complexification. The difference lies in the fact that the field of technique covers processes and tools that cannot place without human intervention. Technique have need of human intervention. The field of technology concerns instead procedures and devices that connect with either and other degrees of independence, even without human intervention, even without human intervention. In the first case, the case of technique, if we look at the matter from an ethical perspective, the human being retains some control over those processes and those tools and is fully responsible for using them. In the second case, the case of technology, is opposed to the action of the technological devices, at some point, such control vanishes. These broaden the concept of responsibility. Now, it is associated with the transformation of the concept of independent action, and the ability to initiate a such action as much as the possibility to continue it in an unexpected way. All these can be attributed to software and machine, too. In the technological context we live in, a number of consequences happen as a result of the transformation I mentioned. Theory is increasingly subsumed under a subject and subjected to practice. Knowledge can be developed and increased only by acting. Just think of the way we operate our devices through plug and play method. Then discoveries and the advancement of knowledge take place through experiments performed by increasingly sophisticated technological devices which do not really test theoretical assumption but rather raise new problems which only additional experiment can deal with. In other words, theory is a, a connection, a link between different practices and is functional to them. Its purpose is no longer to steer or guide some kind of action, not least because, as we have seen before, it can no longer do that. 
then how can these action which is growing ever more independent and self-referential be guided. Its direction is based on action itself. Its direction is based on the same action. It is performed, it is accomplished <coughs> precisely in such action. It is one with action, its veins into action. In, shon, in short, action becomes self-regulatory. More to the point, the only rule that it must ab <coughs> abide by is the rule of its self-affirmation. A specific moral principle is inherent and practicized in that too the principle of utility in the sense of uh, individual utility. The only difference is that here utility is not someone's utility. It is the utility of the mechanism, of the structure, of the process. Utility and function are one and the same for them. Here is the second dimension in which contemporary nihilism can be found. It is not just the meaning of action that vanishes. Meaning boils down to the mere manifestation of action itself, which therefore makes sense in itself. In other words, there is no ulterior dimension, in this case a cognitive dimension, to refer to. What happens is self-explanatory. But there is a consequence to all these. A fact does not have to liquefy into action, and an object does not have to be taken in its dynamism now. As we know, that had been Heidegger's operation. Now, instead, it is action itself that is fixed into fact. Another paradox. The action, the dynamism, is become a fact. Therefore, nihilism is no longer fate or the fulfillment of a destiny. It is just a reality that hides behind the senseless action of bureaucracy of procedures, of increasingly fast and compelling responses. It is the triumph of an increasing dynamism that hangs and waits over us for no reason at all. So, there are, these are the ways in which nihilism appears in my opinion, of course, in its current configuration. Or at least these are some of its distinctive traits in this day and age. What is the role of philosophy in this scenario? At least it is to open possibilities. Such possibilities are related to the ability to retrieve a meaningful structure, an ulterior perspective, instead of veining into the hardened dynamics of explanation and its technical and technological effectiveness. The way it can be done is prompted, that is the thesis I want to put forward, by a rethinking of our humanity, based on the relationships we are involved in. As a matter of fact, in principle, it is the relationship that makes itself, that makes itself with us, in us, among us. In a nutshell, we must change our mindset. Let's see how that can be done. Today, humans, in the context of the nihilism, of scientific explanation 
and self-referential technological practice feel driven to adopt specific behaviors. A common mindset underlies such behaviors, a sort of spirit of the world that uh, even if uh, we do not accept it, even if we fight it, we all end up sharing. Here, I can only mention a few aspects of such common mentality, such mindset. There are three features to it. There is, first and foremost, an understanding of modernity as, as hypermodernity, in the sense of the privilege of the undivided, self-centered, <coughs> self-engrossed individual, first. Second, next to this, however, there is the celebration of the fragility of such individual, the ostentation of such fragility in the different forms accepted today is dependence in this widely emotional ostentation and other people's opinion, and above all, the self-centered individual's readiness just because of his fragility to submit him, herself, to some aspiration that is admittedly more powerful than he or she is. Such aspiration can be, for example, the one expressed by the technological device or the political sphere personified by a leader. In any case, the condition by which we are led into subservience is always the same. That such apparently powerful aspiration promises some form, even a trivial one, even a cheap one, of happiness to individual. To do this, third, that is to find happiness, the individual is more than willing to lose his own individuality. The way he does it is paradoxical, again. First, first he or she claims uh, he or she is different from everyone else. In other words, uh, he or she actually takes uh, his or her individuality to the extreme. He is or her own tasks, he is or her own specificity, even his or her own allergy of food intolerances. But such claim is in fact what everyone does. So, paradoxically, this celebration of individual differences result in indifference, in everyone conforming to everyone else. We are all the same just because we are all different. Not in the sense of respecting our own specificity, but as a way to unavoidable standardization. In other words, and to put it better, in our common diversity, we are all the same, just the same. <clears throat> Here are some specific traits of contemporary common mindset. They hark back to the forms of nihilism I mentioned at the beginning. Let me remind you, the real or apparent replacement of meaning with explanation, the primacy of an action that is an end in itself, that replaces thought and only aims at sustaining itself. Well, in what sense these traits of today's mankind be related to nihilism in its current version? They can be mostly in two ways. <coughs> The first one is by adjusting to such situation, an adjustment that often takes the form of subservience. 
in the second one consists in claiming a scope of action for the individual only, a sort of possibility of action, despite such subservience to a higher, a higher power. Actually, on one hand, as we have seen, the human being claims his own centrality. That is, the fact that his relationship with the other are mainly built on and defined by the individual's relationship with him, herself. It does not matter whether such individual identifies him, herself with and shows his, her fragility. What matters is that in any case, he or she must always be the center of attention, especially their own attention. However, today, all this is moving in ambiguous direction. On the one side, as we have seen, this self-centered and fragile individual claims a scope of action for him herself. He is her own diversity and the right to assert it, the right. On the other side, though, such claim can only be appeased in a limited dimension, that is, in some confined spaces, the space of work, hobbies, the close relationship he or she constantly live in. From a global perspective, instead, what matters is the individuals conforming to a, a superior power to which, more or less deliberately, more or less happily, he or she submits to. So, then, two are the forms in which the individual adapts to the nihilistic dimension, with the confusion of meaning and explanation in the primacy of praxis of a reflection it currently entails. The first form is the one that gives space to the individual, even if it is an ever smaller and ever confront confrontational space that is claiming and asserting his, her rights. A second form is that in which subservience inevitably takes place in return for a few little happy moments small real gratification, whose full accomplishment, though promised, never happens. In other case, the individual feels happy because, at least in the surface, he or she is kept at the center, at the center of a situation that he or she cannot either understand or control, at the center of nothing. How can one get out of this predicament? And then, can we really get out of it? It should be said, above all, that we can at least confront it. We can try to understand and deal with the nihilistic context in which we live. It is essential. It is worth it. Such situation entails unhappiness. It is the unhappiness that comes from disorientation and indifference, that is, a lack of interest in others. The underlying question that contemporary nihilism allows us to highlight is actually, as I said, the one that concerns our relationships. Better said, it is the one that concerns the way we conceive and experience our relationships. Contemporary nihilism is the offspring, as it were, of a veritable relational disorder. What do I mean, this is phrase? Nihilism is a relational disorder. I mean that the fact that the true manifestation of contemporary nihilism, I pointed out, I insist, a confusion of meaning and explanation and the primacy of practice over reflection that require the individual to adapt and subjugate him herself are the outcome 
of a means understanding of the way we conceive of and experience our relationships. The confusion of meaning and explanation makes one conform his her relationship only to the horizontal bond of cause and effects, thus removing the possibility that there may be other kinds of connection, the, one, the ones I called vertical, the connections with what can provide guidance in life and let an explicit narrative develop within which the individual's life can find meaning. The spreading of a senseless and self-relational -rela praxis in technological context is the example of yet another diminishment occurring in our relational approach, whereby the relationship with the self does not only prevail over the relationship with the other, but subjugates and eventually wipes, wipes it out. Here, here is how contemporary nihilism takes the form of a relational disorder, as I said. All these, as Jacobi had rightly intuited, and as Jean Paul Friedrich Richter had staged, all this is the ultimate consequence of a unilateral way of understanding modernity. The modern revolution, as we know, is the one that has put the individual at the center, and rightly, legitimately so. But if it is understood in a unilateral, extreme way, it subjugates the relationship with the other to the relationship with the self. This is the inversion. The relationship with the other ends up being built and established by the relationship with the self. This is the, uh, in the nutshell, the operation of modernity. This is, for example, the emancipatory project that Kant advocates. Only that the unwanted result of such emancipatory project is precisely that the subject who should be emancipated by such approach is, in fact, subjugated to the other. As proven by the historical events of the 20th century and as shown better even better by today's technological advancement, in the end, self-affirmation does not concern the individual at all. It concerns the people, the masses, the global economic structure, the apparatus in which a given system takes shape and sustains itself. To all these, the individual submit, submits him, herself. In a nutshell, subservience is the heterogony of ends, the heterogony of ends in the modern emancipatory project. But this happened because in its developments such project misunderstood the experience and the concept of relationship. It ended up understanding them in a restrictive way, mainly from the perspective of a self-relationship. Instead, a relationship is first and foremost a relationship with the other. It is a relationship with his, which is the first principle, that is, a relationship which is not established by the individual, but one in which the individual is, in fact, always involved. It is also that bond in which different individuals are not subsumed under the same dimension, but remain indifferent. Indeed, 
It is just because of such a bond that they have the opportunity to explore their differences, their mutual identities, and therefore the very bond that unite them. I'm going to finish. A relationship is first and foremost a relationship with the other. A relationship is something that comes first, that involves the individual rather than depending on him. A relationship is a bond between different elements that does not remove their differences. Here are the three distinctive features of a relationship which are first misunderstood and then eliminated in the contemporary context. Retrieving them means saving and properly reviving the very emancipatory process of modernity. Retrieving them means tapping again into the real meaning of our humanity. Retrieving them means getting out of that nihilism which is now increasingly qualifying as a relational disorder. Thank you very much for your attention.